Ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> I'm also uh, very familiar with Catalan surprises, if I may say so. Uh, in March this year, I convened the members of my foreign policy society and said we were going to have a surprise guest. And uh, at that, our meeting, we, I invited uh, Carles Puigdemont to, to uh, address the meeting. And when he had done so, I wished him well and said that you are leaving this room as a free man, and I hope you will stay free. But if he would have taken my advice, he would have taken another road, not via Germany, back to Brussels. But he took the wrong way, and he was arrested the next day in, in this country. Fortunately, he is now in. I would like to ask you to, if you would like to have a very fresh update of the situation in Catalonia, in, a way, in another way, uh, go uh, find on the net a letter from a member of the European Parliament, a Portuguese member of the European Parliament, who had just visited the prisoners of Catalonia in Madrid. And he gives a rather interesting and uh, moving update of the situation. Uh, I could also refer to another the leading article in the biggest newspaper in Helsinki today, this morning, where they try to, let's say, what is the real problem of uh, the Spanish-Catalonian relationship? It is the constitution of Spain. If it is not changed in the next few years, this problem will remain and haunt Spain and Europe also, not at least, of course, mostly Catalonia. So this would like my, my, my let's say, not message, but greetings to, to the uh, reference to the present situation. But democracy, this is the theme of my, my intervention. I've been asked to, to say a few words of that. Uh, as you know, democracy has always been a disputed system. Uh, uh, for a large variety of reasons. Mostly, I think it boils down to a to, uh, uh, question about legitimacy and efficiency of democracy uh, in the handling of the affairs of a nation. Uh, and nor normally, the debate ends with a sigh and a reference to a, uh, uh, something which you have heard many, many times, a quote, a quip from Winston Churchill, uh, democracy is the worst of all systems, apart from all the other systems. Uh, and there it ends. Today, however, we experience a, a new and uh, global uh, wave of doubt. Can democracy survive given all the, cha given all the challenges many societies have est established liberal democracy encounter? I will not, will not list all of these challenges, but um, it boils down, perhaps also in this case, to a major one, the widening gap between citizens and the political establishment. Of course, this gap has always existed due, through history uh, since ancient times. And it is a rather norm, uh, understandable one, as the ruled ones foster and uh, foster an understandable suspicion towards those who raise in the ranks and form the new, always the new power elites. Today, these signs are obvious. Lower participation in general elections, low confidence in the fairness of the system, extremely low voting rates, among the, especially among the youth population, and the drift towards uh, the extremes, either right or left-wing populism. Naturally, these signs ver vary from country to country uh, in traditional Western democracies. But uh, let us move for a while to some other continents. The picture is also bleak there. Some decade ago, the talk was about the victory of liberal democracy. Today, retreat and defeat are more common exp expressions. Look at Africa. The truth is that the vast majority of the African nations declare themselves democracies in the way they inherited from their colonial masters. But the reality is that their democracy is defunct, sabotaged by leaders unwilling to retire uh, once they have been elected. There are many reasons for this failure to plant genuine democracy in Africa, 
uh, and perhaps to develop an African version of democracy based on the culture and the tradition of uh, the continent. Uh, a system which would finally guarantee freedoms, the freedoms and the security of, of the citizens, which is, of course, the ultimate goal of democracy. Uh, in a very compressed form, I believe that there are mainly three reasons in the African case uh, for the, this predicament. Democracy cannot survive in the absence of the rule of law, not in nations torn by civil war and ethnic strife, or in societies penetrated by corruption. Somebody would, of course, say that it is all due to poverty, but I remain, I, I remain convinced that these are the three reasons. If you can't stabilize, let's say, the society around these three rules, uh, there will not be any, there will not be a chance for, for a democratic rule either. If you move to the Asian continent, one can identify another probe, probably more dangerous model for hand the handling of state affairs, the Chinese unique experiment in combining a capitalist market economy with a totalitarian regime. Why is it so dangerous when it has, as we hear, lifted hundreds of millions above the poverty line uh, and um, transformed China into a highly effective working uh, workshop serving the whole globe? Uh, because it becomes a tempting model for other nations and their leaders. Why do we need to bother about uh, time-consuming democracy and inefficient democracies, democratic procedures like elections to achieve prosperity? China offers a handy model for wannabe dictators or leaders with total, total, totalitarian tendencies. What they forget is perhaps the difference in the cultural and the history uh, and the historic roots of China, which are quite different from many other parts of the world. Uh, but in that case, perhaps they look at another smaller brother, the Singapore model, which is also applying uh, formal democracy, but <coughs> with a totalitarian outcome, if I may say so, with, but with high-end economic outcomes. It's perhaps then logical to move to the third continent, North America. I think it is fair to state that uh, the ongoing debate about the future democracy got a new start after the U.S. elections in 2016. Shock elections, some people say. Let us remember that the United States is the oldest democratic republic with strong institutions in order to prevent the misuse of powers by one of them at the same time crediting, creating a federal state with inbuilt tensions between the states and the center. Today, more often, the question is asked, uh, will these institutions in that nation withstand the pressures mounting on them when the body politic is in the grip of an ever-growing polarization between parties divided by both the ideology and the fierce struggle to establish permanent power base uh, by means of manipulating the political system, which we see examples in many, many of the states in the United States. Uh, coming from, from Finland, uh, a Nordic country where democratic values normally are cherished and respected, and the political system is seen as an example of stability. Finland is in some declared the most stable country, stable country in the world. Uh, do I have a really uh, do I really have a case for arguing that we are nearing a crisis in democracy? I agree that a collapse of democracy is not imminent, but I also claim that there is a burning need for to prevent to for preventive reform. How can you invigorate and modernize the European political system? I would in my case start with the political parties, even if the saying is the reform of a political party is like moving a graveyard. You cannot expect any help from the inside. <laughs> Many of our traditional establishment parties are what I would like to call frozen bodies. They have lost the bulk of their membership, and the remaining members are aging people. They seldom turn to their members for advice or decision by letting them vote in internal party votes because they fear that the rank and file could make the wrong decisions. Uh, 
Actually, you may state that party leaders are as afraid of the voters as the voters loathe the politicians. Not a very constructive relationship. Today, according to political scientists, many parties have become cartel parties, meaning that a small group is dominating the affairs and the decision making of the party. Even if the party has maintained its mass character, the members are mostly un unable to formulate its policy platform because the mass parties and their cartel leaders strive to create the broadest possible ideological program in order to maintain their political base. Um, a party reform program must contain measures to increase contacts between the leadership members and voters. Normally, e electronic channels are the recommendations of the day, but uh, I ask, will that really be enough to stimulate politics and build trust and legitimacy in the political system? I believe not, even if the younger generation is communicating that way. What, in my opinion, is needed is to recreate the emotional bond between the actors, a bond which has been broken or weakened in the last decades. Democracy also contains two inherent and somehow contradicting <laughs> dimensions, conflict and compromise. Both are necessary to guarantee the need for political dynamism. Citizens must be able to recognize the differences between the policies and the ideologies of the parties. If they see only a gray mass, uh, a gray scale of similar offers, parties tending to battle uh, for the secure middle ground and forming then, after elections, broad coalitions, uh, voters will lose interest. On the other hand, if they see parties involved only in futile, futile turf battles, unable to reach constructive compromises, they will also turn away from politics. Even worse, they may in both cases turn to extremist offers, far to the right or far to the left, or far to anywhere, I don't know. <laughs> uh, we see around us parties which have lost their ambition or their ability to rethink and create and a renewed vision of, for the society and for their own role in building that society. Without wishing to be partisan, an example in case is the fate of European social democracy. Once a strong reformist movement, trusted by large swaths of electorate or the electorate, now being seen in many countries as a sunset party. I'm not going to dwell on the reasons, there are many good reasons for, to we're understanding that there's a disappearance of industrial jobs and so on and so further. But uh, discussing democracy, you must, of course, look at the forces challenging the political system. Populists from the right and the left can be said to question both the legitimacy and the efficiency of democracy, proclaiming that they speak for the true and genuine citizens those not heard by the elites, as they say. First, let me say that populism has always been a part of liberal democracies. Most parties spice their political message with popular and superficial demands, very well aware that many of them are unrealistic and will be soon forgotten, especially after the elections. Second, let me also say that populism is not always bad. It is an important signal to the establishment. Beware, you have not done your homework. You have lost contact with your grassroots. Historically, when early populist movements um, eh, and parties in the US politics gained ground 100 years ago, it uh, forced the two establishment parties to watch out and to reform. But that's historically. I don't know if it happens now, but, but that happened at that time. Populism, populism becomes dangerous for the democratic state only when such a party is supported by three factors, as I can see it. It has a charismatic and ruthless leader. It can ride on the fear of citizens during a period of change. And it achieves such electoral success that it gets its hands on the wheels of the state. Today, we know that 
uh, that the temptation is there to change the rules of the game in order to, to uh, cement those gains. We need to go no further than to European states like Hungary, Poland, close enough Turkey also. In the US, if constitutionally possible, President Trump would certainly be inclined to interfere with the role of the judiciary to introduce more voting limitations and to tamper with press freedom. We have seen all the signs on the wall. Uh, I would like to ask, can populists be defeated? Many in the establishment asks that question eagerly. My personal view is that there are two ways. One is tactic and one is strategic. It is possible to integrate some populist parties into the political system before they have grown too strong and too self-confident. My country has a fairly positive experience from the last four, four last decades in that respect, involving three different movements of populist character by teaching them the hard lessons of taking responsibility for the affairs of the state. No one of them emerged from that experience without severe wounds and without the revelation among their voters that there are no easy solutions to the problems of society. And these experiments in inclusion avoided the birth of an isolated outcast group and enhanced social cohesion. I am not, I'm not happy with all these decisions behind that, but the end result is fairly positive. You see another version of integration which I do not in endorse giving extreme and or populist groups an influence on government politics and programs, buying their support, but not integrating them into the, uh, the, so the responsible decision-making uh, machinery. By doing this, they can influence without paying the price by sharing the responsibility for decisions taken. In other words, they can eat the cake and keep it. That is happening now in several countries around Europe uh, that Foremost example is perhaps Denmark. The more strategic, responsible, and sound approach to popu populism is to take a better look on the issues which are feeding the, the discontent and act to <coughs> eliminate the reasons for that discontent. It has become common practice to stamp the populist label on problems and demands you do not like yourself, but it would be essential to accept uh, that also populists can have a point. The most burning example, migration. If the political establishment continue to insist that migration does not affect or change our societies, it opens gates wide open for the populists to exploit the fears of citizens who see it otherwise. Again, the responsible politicians need to stay in touch, need to communicate, need to educate instead of applying their own progressive views on the potential voters. I remember uh, when I, uh, I see a friend from Holland here, I remember an uh, 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 opinion poll in, in from Holland where the Holland, Hol D Dutch politicians, uh, nine out of 10 uh, was of the opinion that their opinions were more progressive and more and better than those of the voters. That is the normal uh, opinion of decision makers normally, that we are a little bit on a higher le level, higher standards than our voters, which is, is, is a little bit dangerous, I might say. I would like to see our liberal democracies and the politicians moving into a more experimental mode. Democracy is already 200 years old, Republican and parliamentary democracy only 100. Believing that democracy alone uh, could survive and flourish without reforms is a rather absurd idea when so many other institutions and habits are transforming themselves and moving all those times forward in, in history, so to say. Our philosophers can contribute in this respect. A more, they suggest, many of them suggest a more deliberative democracy in and that can be, uh, let's say, implemented in many ways. But one way is lottery. May sound frivolous, uh, but it could actually be quite a reliable way of measuring public, public sen sentiments. 
uh, we have opinion polls. The politicians normally fall, uh, let's say, create their policies based on opinion polls. But opinion polls, if I would go into details, are not reliable. Not reliable, I repeat it. You believe that they are reliable because they are the published uh, thing which you see all around you. But only through uh, lottery, I am not well on the details how you, how you create that, that those platforms are much more reliable. Uh, and I claim that uh, democracy would benefit from, from uh, the in, in introdu introduction of, let's say, uh, 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 let's say a, a parallel form of checking what the public sentiments are <laughs> through deliberative uh, democracy uh, formed on, on, on uh, side by side with the elected representatives bod bodies. I am not certainly not a supporter of referenda, not only because of the outcome of the recent ones. We mostly refer to Brexit nowadays, but if David Cameron would have listened to his uh, old party friend, now passed away, Margaret Thatcher, she said that uh, referenda are the favorite device of demagogues and dictators, and she was quite right. We see it also happening around the world that you to catch the, 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 that instrument when you, when you need to, to cement your powers often. But I'm happy to report that my country a few years back introduced uh, another form of, not referenda, but another form of listening. Uh, the right uh, to people's initiative, 50,000 citizens can launch and sign an initiative for new legislation. This has become rather popular among the people. 80% of, 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 of citizens um, uh, endorse it and believes it's increasing the, the legitimacy of the <coughs> political system. Even if only two of these initiatives have been approved by the parliament in, in recent years, it sends a signal that the body politic is listening and can be influenced that way. We have it in other countries also. Finally, in conclusion, uh, a conclusion I reached in a recent book I published about the future of democracy. I was inspired by, by my friend Carl Erik Norman, also who published another book of that already in 2009, and uh, outlining some of the, 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 the threats to democracy at that time. But we are going into a new mode now, 10 years later. Uh, and the conclusion I reached in my book is uh, about the challenges to liberal democracy. Our societies need more democracy education for our young ones, for the next generation. It is essential to transfer the understanding of the ex existential meaning of democracy. It is the best shield and protection for the values we all cherish, personal safety, the rule of law, freedom of expression, and human rights. We need to tell future, gener future generations that no other systems offer this these guarantees. Thank you.